Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I am going to be reading the first chapter of today is called To Catch a Thief and this is by Martha Brokenbrow. This book takes place in a small town in the Pacific Northwest called Urchin Beach and Urchin Beach is known for its Dragonfly Day Festival and this special staff that it has that every year on this festival people come from all over outside of Urchin Beach and they come to pay five dollars to swing this special staff over their head three times and have a whole year of good luck and this is something that really keeps this small town afloat it's very important but they also love to celebrate this day the dragonfly day festival occurs at a time when the first dragonflies are hatching and sighted and the first person who sees one on that day actually gets a thousand dollars so this is a big event for the town at the center of our story we have amelia mcguffin who has four younger siblings. Her parents own a general store in town that sells everything. And the small town is very close knit. So we meet a lot of the neighbors and the other store owners, the other towns people. We also meet the McGuffin's new neighbors, the Morses. There are two twins, Dot and Dash. They are seventh graders. So they are a year above Amelia, who's heading into middle school. And it's exciting to meet the new neighbors and get to know them. The staff, goes missing at the very beginning of the book. There's a thief that takes the staff and this could potentially derail the entire Dragonfly Day Festival and then make it so that Urchin Beach does not earn its annual revenue from that festival. Amelia decides that she will take it upon herself to solve the mystery of who stole the staff and to become a world-class detective. So she enlists the help of the Morses. She occasionally enlists the help of her younger siblings. She enlists the help of a neighbor who she's kind of scared of, who writes mystery novels. And she enlists the help of the librarian. Throughout the course of this, some more things start to go missing and the story takes off from there. So we have this detective story where Amelia is trying to learn to be a detective but then also to find out who's stealing these things. We have this wonderful family story. We have a story of friendship and this amazing town, which is in and of itself a character in this book. So I'm going to read to you the first two chapters of To Catch a Thief because the first one is very, very short. Chapter one, so it begins. A thief stood at the edge of a charming but rundown village. Cars sped by, the thief took a deep breath from one direction came the scents of salt water, washed up kelp and dead crabs. From the other, fresh bread, crackling fires, herb gardens, and even a few rose bushes. The town smelled good, as if it could be home. The air smelled of something else too, rain. All the better, the thief observed. Rain drives people indoors. Rain is almost as good as the cover of darkness when it comes to thieving. The first drop spiraled downward, then more. Soon it became a downpour, drumming the gravel on the shoulder of the highway, gathering in murky puddles. The thief, now drenched, left the road and passed a sign that read, Welcome to Urchin Beach. Below that, a second sign read, Countdown to the World Famous Dragonfly Day Festival. And below that, a third sign showed the number seven, a lucky number, as just about anyone will tell you. The thief paid no attention to the signs. That's because the thief had spied something wonderful, something they wanted, something they would take. Chapter two, when it rains, it pours. Amelia McGuffin thought of rainy days as mystery weather. She liked the way a good rain blurred the edges of things, how it seemed to tap secret codes against the roof. Rain also felt cozy, which happens to be a type of mystery that takes place in a small community and is solved by an amateur detective. Amelia wished this sort of thing would happen in her town, to her even, not that it ever would. One drizzly Saturday in August, she was reading in the window seat of the turret in her crooked old house. She set down her book. She already knew how it ended. Usually knowing the ending comforted her, but now it made her feel stuck. Sixth grade was starting in two weeks. 
She should have been with her two best friends, mapping out their survival strategy. But Delphine was at camp and Bertie was at her family's newspaper, angling for her first reporting assignment. And worse, Amelia's parents were working extra long days at the general store, which meant Amelia was trapped at home with her younger siblings and their babysitter. Amelia didn't need a babysitter. In protest, she tromped upstairs while everyone else was below, making a ruckus and chocolate chip cookies. Amelia nibbled at a fingernail. Sometimes she felt like an extra character in a book, the unimportant sort described as the boy with the blue shirt or the girl with the rainbow braces. All around her were more interesting people living more daring lives. Delphine had moved here from Taiwan when she was three and had just headed to a summer camp for young oceanographers. Bertie was an indirect descendant of Martin Luther King Jr. and took pictures for the Urchin Beach Gazette. She planned to become a real live reporter there before she turned 12. Amelia's sister Bridget was an acrobat. Her brother Colin was an inventor and the twins, Duncan and Emma, were funny and adorable even if they couldn't use the toilet yet. Amelia didn't have the gumption even for the littlest things. For example, she wanted to change the way her hair was parted. Her current style felt babyish, but she was too nervous. What if people thought she was trying to be cooler than she was? What if people liked her old hair better? Face it, she told herself, you can't even win a battle with a comb. She rubbed smudges off her glasses and studied the winding streets below. Only a few people braved the rain. Even the crows and robins had taken shelter. On the other side of the room, a wide window framed a view of Dr. Agatha's manor. It was a grim and glowering edifice separated from the MacGuffin's house by a thick hedge that shimmered with rainwater. A single light was on, the one in Dr. Agatha's study, where she wrote murder mysteries that were famous for their lengthy descriptions of death by unusual methods. Rare poisons, buckets of concrete dropped from heights, evil deeds with construction equipment, and even suffocation by marshmallow fluff. Right what you know, that's what Amelia's fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Neuschwanger, had told them. It made Amelia wonder how Dr. Agatha knew so much about murder. Amelia could only conclude that Dr. Agatha had killed before, probably more than once. Thank goodness for the hedge between their houses. It wasn't a high stone wall, but it wasn't nothing. Amelia turned back to her usual window as a moving truck rolled into view. With a squeal of brakes, the truck stopped at the house across the street, which had been vacant for as long as she could remember. She gasped, new neighbors. She'd have to tell Bertie. Bertie would want to take photos for the newspaper. Delphine would also want to know, but her camp had a no cell phone rule and took place on a boat. So Amelia couldn't even send a letter. No matter, it would be a wonderful surprise for when she returned. A family emerged, two kids and a pair of women who looked motherish. The kids were twins, a boy and a girl, like Duncan and Emma. They had vibrant red hair that stood out in the gloom. But what made Amelia's skin prickle wasn't their hair. It was their age. They were seventh graders. She was sure of it. She, Bertie and Delphine, had a theory that seventh graders were the scariest people in middle school, but only because eighth graders no longer cared. Before she could dial Bertie's number, on the house landline, several sets of feet pounded the stairs, Bridget's footsteps loud and certain, Collins careful and light, and then Duncan and Emma taking the stairs one at a time because that's what toddlers do. They'd obviously seen the truck and were coming to her for a pronouncement on what it meant. Amelia turned away from the window, folded her hands in her lap, and waited for the people she loved most in the world to arrive. And that's the end of chapter two. So I read those two chapters because I wanted you to meet Amelia and her siblings. And this book is very well written, but it's also very funny. And the characters in this book, all of them, Amelia, her parents, her siblings, her neighbors and friends, as I said, all the people in the town, they're really wonderful, well-developed characters. They have funny, punny names. And some of the lines are delivered with this dry sense of humor. So it's a lot of fun to read. Plus it also has this mystery in it. And there's a dog, a wonderful dog. I always love a book with a dog. So I highly recommend To Catch a Thief by Martha Brokenbro. Thanks for joining me.